Oh, hi, me again. Remember this? In the next part of the series, we delve deeper into the causes of melting on Larsen C. So this is the interesting bit. We use that data set to ask some exciting science questions about what are the most important causes of surface melting on the Larsen C ice shelf. And the results are in. This is the top of the melt charts. In at number one, it's solar radiation. At number two, they're hot and they're dry, they're fern winds. A new entry at number three, we've got clouds. And finally, number four, large scale circulation. Let's start at number one, it's a good place to start, it's solar radiation. In summer, we have 24 hour daylight over Larsen C. Yep, that means you can be stumbling around at 3 a.m. in glorious Technicolor. In sunny conditions, we get more surface melting than average. That is what you're seeing here in this plot, where red colors show that there is more melt than average during sunny conditions. And by the way, you're gonna have to get used to these plots because you're gonna see a lot more of them. Coming in at a not so close second is fern. You'll remember that fern are these warm, dry winds that are really important on the Antarctic Peninsula. And if you need a reminder, you can check out my first ever video up here. Just remember not to cringe too much for me when you watch it. Fern conditions are mostly responsible for that east-west gradient in melting that we see over Larsen C. So we've always surmised that they are pretty important. And this reinforces that. Turns out fern are especially important for driving melt in non-summer seasons. For instance, take a look at the classical C-shaped pattern of melt anomalies, and that's differences from the average during autumn. Fern are most important in spring and autumn, but they still occur in summer where they can add to the effect of sunny conditions. And that can drive what I'm calling super mega melt. In fact, that super mega melt can happen in other seasons too. Take a look at this. In summer, when you get sunny conditions but no fern, you get lots of melting. Compare that to spring or autumn when temperatures are too cold in those conditions to allow melting and you actually get less melt than normal. And that's what those blue colours indicate. On the flip side, in summer if you have fern but it's not sunny, you get more melting around the edges of the ice shelf because the fern winds warm the inlets as they blow downhill but you get less melting over the ice shelf because it's not as sunny and therefore melty as it is usually. Now look at the same conditions, but for autumn. You can see that fern are much more important in this season than in summer. But in spring, even with fern, you still get below average melt. Now, what happens when we add the two together like this? With fern and sunny conditions acting together, i.e. super mega melt, you get above average melting in all seasons, albeit with a slightly different signature in each. What this means is that in summer, sunny conditions are the dominant driver of melt. In autumn, the main driver is fern, and in spring, you need the two acting together to produce the most significant melting events. Right, so we know the top two, but what's the third gonna be? That's right, number three is cloud. Now, this one is a little complex. Classic clouds, am I right? Clouds stop sunlight reaching the ice shelf surface. So in summer, clouds suppress melting, as you can see here. But in spring and autumn, they can create a thermal blanketing effect and can raise temperatures enough to allow slight melting to occur. Here, the colours that you're looking at are actually maximum near surface air temperature anomalies. So you can see that in cloudy conditions, it's a little bit warmer than usual. It's hard to see in the melt plots because these are averages for the whole season, but in spring and autumn, cloud can raise temperatures enough to initiate or sustain melting. And that's especially at the end of spring or the beginning of autumn when it's slightly warmer generally. Now the eagle-eyed among you may be screaming at your screen right now because there is another connection here, and that's between fern and cloud and sunniness. 
It's thought that one way that fern contribute to ice shelf melting is by dispelling any clouds that are usually over the ice shelf, allowing lots of solar radiation to reach the surface. And that's what you might call cloud clearance. And surprise, surprise, when low cloud cover and fern coincide, you also tend to have lots of sunshine, i.e. sunny fern, aka super mega melt. There are some important differences between seasons though, and this is where it starts to get interesting from a cloudy perspective. In summer, we found that you get lots of melting during periods where you have lots of thin cloud that contains relatively little liquid water. Now this can mean one of two things. One, we have high level ice clouds and fern winds, which cause low level cloud clearance, allowing lots of sunshine to reach the surface. Or two, we have thin liquid bearing low level cloud, which is thin enough to allow some solar radiation through it, but is also thick enough and warm enough to have a thermal blanketing effect and trap outgoing heat. In fact, this is the mechanism that explains the, at the time, unprecedented melting we saw in Greenland in 2012, and then later in 2019 and 2020, that saw nearly the whole ice sheet melting for several days at a time. Now this is significant because during cloudy conditions, it's usually too cold for melting to occur over Larsen C, except in some limited circumstances that I've just mentioned. But, as the climate warms and it's predicted to warm by several degrees on the Antarctic Peninsula in the coming decades, the conditions for melting to occur will start to happen more often. In fact, it will only take warming of just over one degree Celsius to put the average temperature during cloudy conditions on Larsen at zero degrees, AKA melt point. So it seems like Larsen C might start to look a little bit more like Greenland in future with extensive cloud mediated melting becoming more commonplace. But anyway, uh, back to the charts because in fourth place is large scale circulation. Large scale circulation patterns like the Amundsen C low, SAM or ENSO all set up conditions that either enhance or suppress melting on Larsen C. When the Amundsen Sea Low, which is a pattern of low pressure just west of the peninsula, is especially deep and close to the peninsula, that enhances melting. Positive SAM conditions, when strong westerly winds circle closer to the Antarctic Peninsula, and El Nino conditions, which are related to relatively cool Pacific sea surface temperatures, both create conditions for strong melting over Larsen Sea too. Oh, and by the way, you can see my videos on SAM and ENSO here and here. That's because all three cause air to flow across the peninsula, producing fern winds and suppressing cloudiness over Larsen C. In fact, we can see here that the phase of the SAM is positively correlated with fern occurrence on Larsen, and that's during all seasons, meaning that when the SAM is in its positive phase, fern are more likely to occur. Similarly, large scale features are responsible for suppressing melt. So for example, barrier winds, which form when air flows down off the cold Antarctic continent, negative SAM and La Nina conditions, all of those suppress melt. So in short, large scale circulation patterns set up the big picture of the conditions. And from there, the more localized features color in the detail to determine whether or not we actually see melt. And these can vary depending on the season. Now, one thing I've taken from this work is the complexity of all of these relationships. And it's worth emphasizing again that they can all happen together. They can act in the same direction or the opposite direction. And of course, the seasonal impacts are really, really important too. Hopefully this work will help us to understand a bit more about what's going on over last and see now, and also to help us predict its future fate. Make sure you check out both papers and if you like this video, please like it, please share it, please subscribe to the channel. And if you can, please consider supporting me on Patreon because it really helps me make these videos better. Anyway, I'll put all the links in the description below and feel free to drop me your thoughts, feel free to drop me your comments. I'm really looking forward to reading them. Until next time.